Welcome everybody. My name's Anne-Marie Lupinow and I'm the director of the Rudy Bruner Award for Urban Excellence at the Bruner Foundation. Uh, this year we are partnering with Northeastern and the Myra Craft Open Classroom to curate a series of sessions that focus on the role of design in cities. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, the Rudy Bruner Award is a National Urban Design Award that was established in 1987 to recognize and share the stories of transformative places that contribute to the economic, environmental, and social vitality of American cities. In tonight's session, we're going to Greenville, South Carolina, where we will be joined by Greenville Mayor Knox White, who will share the story of the creation of Falls Park on the Reedy, a 2015 Rudy Bruner Award sil silver medalist, which is a 26 acre park in the heart of downtown Greenville. Falls Park, which opened in 2004, is the transformation of a forgotten waterfall and river valley into an urban oasis, which has become a centerpiece for the city. Mayor White and Southern Side Neighborhood in Action President Mary Duckett will discuss how the development of Falls Park on the Reedy prompted dialogue about equity in the city and inform the planning of a subsequent 60 acre park currently in development. And although Falls Park on the Reedy is less than 20 years old, it's actually the realization of a civic vision generated more than 100 years ago, and there's more than one Boston connection. Tonight's respondents include two people who are deeply involved in the creation, expansion, and preservation of Boston's infrastructure, Northeastern University's Dan Adams and the Emerald Necklace Conservancy's Karen Monty Brodeck. Once again, we are partnering with the Boston Society of Architects to offer continuing AIA, sorry, AIA continuing education credits. Please use the link that we'll put in the chat box to submit your name and member number. So I just wanna provide some brief introductions for our panelists this evening. Mayor Knox White has served as mayor of Greenville, South Carolina since 1995. Mayor White's goal is to make Greenville the most beautiful and livable city in America and has emphasized innovative public-private partnerships and strategic investments in the city's neighborhoods and downtown. He spearheaded the removal of a four-lane state highway bridge constructed over the Reedy River Falls and the creation of the award-winning Falls Park. Mayor White was honored by Time Magazine as one of 31 people who are changing the South for his role in revitalizing downtown Greenville. Mary, not, sorry, Mary Duckett is a long, lifelong activist and resident of Greenville's Southern Side community. As president of Southern Side Neighborhoods in Action, she joined community leaders and environmental justice advocates to call for cleanup of toxic waste along the Reedy River that was left behind by a manufacturing plant that closed in 1952. Ms. Duckett has been instrumental in supporting in support for the ongoing development of Unity Park. In 2019, she was honored with the Greenville Drive Green Day Award in recognition of her decades long work on behalf of Greenville and its communities. Dan Adams is the director and associate professor of the School of Architecture at Northeastern University. He teaches design studios and seminars that focus on the intersection of architecture, infrastructure, landscape architecture, and cities. Dan is also a founding principal of Landing Studio, a Boston-based architecture, design, and research practice that focuses on improving infrastructure in the public realm. Karen Monty Brodeck is the president of the Emerald Necklace Conservancy, an organization charged with protecting, restoring, and maintaining the 1,100 acres that comprise Boston's Emerald Necklace. Under her leadership, the Conservancy has developed new exhibitions, signage, and programs that are raising the profile of its parks and is working with neighborhood advocates to revitalize Charles Gate Park, where Boston's Back Bay meets the Kenmore neighborhood. Previously, Karen served as Deputy Director for Park Planning and the Manager of the Community Opportunity Fund for the City of San Francisco Parks Department. Tonight, as on other nights, we're going to begin with a presentation from Mayor White and Mary about their respective work in Greenville. Then we'll pivot to a conversation with the two of them and Dan and Karen before turning to audience Q&A. Please remember to use the Q&A box to submit your questions and we look forward to an engaging conversation. So, um, and we will be joined in a little while by Ted Landsmark, our, our um, leader in this effort. So I will turn this over to Mayor White and Ms. Duckett. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> it's a thank you, Anne-Marie. It's always a pleasure to talk to you and uh, thank you for the Bruner Foundation and, 
and Northeastern University. Uh, I'm very honored to have a chance to present uh, some information from Greenville, South Carolina, where it is sunny and warm today. So uh, that's a good thing to start off with, I say. Um, but thank you very much. And we got a lot of material to cover, but I'm gonna basically profile two different parks, uh, successful park projects. One is complete. Uh, the other is a massive construction site as we sit here now. Uh, but a little background for you, if you will. Uh, this is a Greenville, South Carolina, in case you didn't know. I have a little map here to show you where we are. My technical assistance here. Um, well, we're already off to a little technical glitch here. Okay, there we go. Uh, Greenville is located between Atlanta and Charlotte on Interstate 85. This is a economically very successful area all the way along I-85. And Greenville is actually uh, the largest metropolitan area in South Carolina. We're larger than Charleston and Columbia in terms of overall population in the area, but that's where we're located. Uh, the story begins this way. Uh, downtown Greenville, South Carolina looked like most cities in America in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, the malls had opened, uh, downtowns were deserted. Uh, this is a main street scene from 1970s, a four lane um, highway main street with mostly abandoned buildings. You, everybody knows those kind of stories. We had some good leadership uh, back in the 80s. Uh, they did something really bold and dramatic. They took a, the four lane road and turned it into a two lane walkable downtown in the 1980s, early 1980s. And that's what it looks like today. A beautiful half mile of tree line boulevard that is the downtown. We have very vibrant downtown now. It's all very walkable, a, a wonderful mix of uses of office residential downtown, lots of residential downtown and retail. It's all back. Uh, that's the story of the downtown the last several years. A lot of hard work on everybody's part, but it's a very vibrant, walkable place. Uh, but Greenville had something else going for it, uh, but didn't understand it for a long time. Um, in the middle of the city, in the middle of the downtown is a river called the Reedy River. And the Reedy River also includes in downtown a 30 foot waterfall. Go back a minute, a little bit too fast. <laughs> and uh, this is a picture from the early 1900s because at one time in the city's history, the, the falls was the most important thing about the city. Uh, but like a lot of American cities during the time the downtown was deserted, people abandoned the river and the river became very polluted. We had a lot of textile plants up and down the river. Uh, many of those plants, as, as you may know, came from New England originally and they dotted the, the Reedy River and polluted it. It was so bad that in 1960, the state highway department could place with very little controversy, could place a four lane highway bridge directly on top of the greatest natural asset the city had, which was Reedy River Falls. And that scene I showed from 1900s, it was all forgotten uh, for over, for over, well, several generations actually, uh, people forgot the river even existed. No one was there, it was all deserted around the river and the waterfall totally hidden away for over 30 years by a four lane highway bridge. When I came in as mayor, uh, we began some discussions to have an aspiration to do something with this waterfall for obvious reasons, but it was a very controversial thing because uh, we basically were telling people that we had a plan to spend $13 million to build a beautiful park, beautiful garden around a waterfall you've never seen, uh, trust us. And uh, a lot of people did not. Uh, it was quite a controversy at the time. For over about a five or six year period, big political debate over the removing the highway bridge, which people call the, often called the perfectly good highway bridge. Had a member of city council who even, who even proposed to me one time that perhaps instead of removing the bridge, we should, and this is a true story, he said, we should move the waterfall. And I said, well, how would you do that? He said, blow it up <laughs> with dynamite. Uh, so we had a lot of really just crazy debate back and forth. I'm not sure we ever convinced a majority of the public, but again, remember most people who lived in Greenville all their lives had never seen the waterfall in over a generation. And that's what we were living with. Uh, but the debate continued until we got some good people on city council, uh, finally got the votes to take the bold step, even though we did not have popular consent, I would say. We did it, we removed the four lane highway. Uh, this is the picture during the demolition and beginning of construction process. You can kind of see where the waterfall is very close to it. It's virtually cheek to jowl with Main Street, this lower section of Main Street. Uh, I would say and also this picture shows you an area of the downtown that was pretty well deserted. There's really nothing on the river, uh, nothing in that entire two or three mile area around it. Most of the successful downtown was up the street. 
So long and short is uh, we took a four lane highway bridge and turned it into this, a beautiful pedestrian suspension bridge. Today Falls Park is the centerpiece of downtown Greenville, surrounded by condominiums, hotels, uh, center of activity. It's, it's given the community a sense of identity, the Liberty Bridge, which is the name of the bridge, and the falls. Um, it's what the city is all about. Uh, the beautiful Liberty Bridge uh, is illuminated at night. It is, here's the bo first Boston connection. We'll have several tonight. Uh, the Liberty Bridge is designed by Miguel Rosales, who designed the Zakem Bridge in Boston. Uh, we found Miguel uh, in the middle of that project, by the way, I flew to Boston and met with him. He said he'd always wanted to build a, a pedestrian bridge, but no one wanted one until we knocked on the door. <clears throat> he built this beautiful bridge. It's a beautiful piece of art and piece of engineering. It's a centerpiece of the park. Here's another Boston connection. Uh, the park area exploded in new development the last uh, 10 years. <clears throat> it includes a mixed use baseball stadium. Greenville Drive is a Boston Red Sox affiliate. This is our little Fenway surrounded by residential condos because everything we do is mixed use in downtown Greenville. Everything is mixed use. Residential is a part of everything. And you see that in this picture here. So that's our Fenway ballpark. And by the way, the Red Sox organization is fantastic with the city of Greenville. We're just, we just got renewed uh, during the minor league shuffle, if you will. So we're happy about that. I want to show you this now. <clears throat> this is a, uh, just want to take you into Falls Park, a little, little short video to give you a better feel. one second. Okay. Well, you got to have technical difficulties. I told Anne Marie to be the first time we ever went through one if we didn't have something. Uh, so next. Oh, here we are. Okay, good. So let me talk about the economic impact of Falls Park. It is a beautiful place. It's brought tourism to the city. It also had, as you might expect, a powerful economic impact on this entire area of our downtown, which heretofore was extremely blighted and underdeveloped for several miles, including where the baseball stadium sits today. Uh, this is a photograph, I love this picture, because this is what it looked like across the street from the entrance to Falls Park on Main Street on the week the park opened. And right across the street was really a mile of small blighted buildings and I think this is a picture of what the river area looked like across the street from Falls Park about the time the park opened. Within just three years, this is what the neighborhood turned into. A beginning of a very vibrant mixed use environment. Uh, this is directly across the street from the park. Now what you have here are hotels, uh, condominiums, apartments, residential retail galore. Um, uh, lots of uh, vibrant economic activity, just what you want. Uh, you also have, uh, a, you see the bottom of this trail, this trail system is part of a nearly tw nearly 20 mile bike and walking trail along the river that is very popular now, it's all in place. You see it emanates from downtown and goes on up, on up for another 20 miles. But we also see here, uh, go back to this one moment. While this is very successful, it's everything the city would want tourism, economic vitality, uh, and huge investment in the river area heretofore abandoned. We, did, we were aware of something else going on. We, we saw that you know, the public space is very beautiful and very inclusive. The private space, not so much. 
Uh, it's very beautiful, uh, but it's very exclusive. Million dollar, these condominiums on the river go for over a million dollars and they're all filled, they're, they're doing great. So we began looking at this area in terms of uh, what could we do different if we're building a different kind of park as we began to study to do just a few years later after Falls Park opened. We began to work on a park that was up the river about a mile, a mile straight up the river. Um, there it is, Falls Park up the river to a place that we would later call Unity Park. And that's where this new story begins. Uh, this area, again, up the river, kind of Greenville's backyard, has quite a history. And believe it or not, once again, we have a little Boston connection going on here. Uh, the idea, the concept of a park in this location uh, was first introduced to Greenville in 1907. In 1907, uh, Greenville's always been good about planning, as you kind of gather now, and partnerships. In 1907, we uh, invited to the city, apparently our forefathers did, uh, a group from, uh, from Boston, is the uh, Harlan Kelsey, a landscape architect of some renown in that era. They came and spent a good bit of time and produced this report, which I, I've kept this copy on my desk for almost 20 years. It's actually very good, very well written, has good illustrations, and it still kind of speaks to us. In 1907, a, a plan for Greenville, South Carolina is downtown. And uh, I want to tell you that they were very discreet in how they described things, but uh, they saw a lot in Greenville in 1907 that they did not like. And they illustrated it with pictures of really bad trees, some really disgusting scenes of, of garbage and trash uh, near, the, uh, near the downtown at that time. But then they also took an, another chapter in this book and talked about something they liked a lot. So in 1907, uh, the Boston group said, of all the things we've seen, the most important thing is your river. And by the way, we've traveled around the country and we've never seen an urban, <clears throat> an urban waterfall like we see in Greenville. They just rhapsodized about it. And it says here, it's without a doubt, the river and the falls is without a doubt the most important single feature to be considered in the development and beautification of your city. And that was in 1907. But they took it a step further. And uh, uh, Karen, you'll appreciate this. They brought the idea of the Emerald necklace to Greenville. And they took the Reedy River and they, they suggested three parks along the river to create the Emerald Necklace. Uh, one of those suggestions was for a place, it says here, Reedy River Park. Within four years, the city actually did this. They created a 100 acre park along the river that today is called Cleveland Park. And it was from, directly from the 1907 plan. They also recommended that a park be built around, obviously, the waterfall, the single most important feature in the whole city, they said, in 1907. It would take us about 100 years to create that park, but the plan was always out there. And then, then they suggested a third park, and that park is the park we're building today, in 2021, called Unity Park along the river. So we're completing the 1907 plan. So let's talk about this. So this is what you find when you go up the river. <clears throat> the, park, um, the park is bisected by the Reedy River. <clears throat> it's an industrial, post-industrial site, kind of a classic post-industrial site, lots of warehouses and, and other undesirable things I'll tell you about in a minute. But notice this also, it is, it is just up from downtown from Main Street, but it's also surrounded on one side by a neighborhood, a predominantly African-American neighborhood called Southern Side. It's called Southern Side because it's not the southern part of Greenville. It's actually West Greenville, but it's called Southern Side because it sits in the middle, or the, in the middle of it sits <clears throat> the uh, Southern Railroad Station, and that's important because so many people had jobs at that time in the railroad. So it's a vast residential area and, and some some uh, retail um, with people related to to the railroad. So that's what's called Southern Side. It's the old railroad station. The um, the idea of, of going back to this plan of 1907 and, and realizing this longstanding idea of a park in the southern side area um, first happened around 2002. It was just a few, just a year or so after, uh, about the time Falls Park opened, uh, we hired Clemson University uh, to work with the city and the county to work on a vision for the Reedy River outside of Falls Park. And uh, they created this con conceptual uh, that, that's going to be kind of guide what we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, one of the creators of Falls Park is a gentleman and a good friend named Tom Keith. And he first sketched out the early renderings of what this area could look like if we get the warehouses and all the undesirable stuff out of the way 
we could create this magnificent green space. If <clears throat> Falls Park is about if Falls Park is about seven or eight acres, maybe ten acres. This is sixty acres. So, so that was kind of the first phase uh, of planning. Until in 2013, we brought in another group of planners, and we began really to first engage the neighborhood in the discussion about this area that's in the backyard of the Southern Side neighborhood. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then uh, this is 2014. Uh, we had a West End planning process, which was a larger geographic footprint around this neighborhood. Uh, brought in consultants, lots of neighborhood meetings. And that was also some of the first conversation we had about, you know, this is not just about building green space and park space. It's also about the larger residential neighborhood, the predominantly historically African-American neighborhood around it and how we could maintain the vitality and character of that neighborhood. So we had a lot of neighborhood meetings and such. We even involved us two of the elementary schools that were in the area and asked kids what they'd like to see in the, in the neighborhood around their school. Came up with some great ideas with that. I think at this point, Mary Duckett's gonna join us. Uh, in the middle of this area was a, uh, a small park called Mayberry Park. The reason it's significant, and I'll tell you a little more about it in a minute, is that historically Mayberry goes back to the 1920s and it was at one time the only African-American park in the city of Greenville. It was a segregated park. And even through these 50s and 60s and 70s, it was not a very well uh, cared for park. And that this whole area, as you'll see in a minute, was not exactly taken care of by the city or anyone else. Uh, but to talk a little bit more about the Southern Side neighborhood and their, their association with the park area, if you will, is, uh, is my good friend, Mary Duckett. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here talking about Greenville because I love Greenville. Uh, I often tell people that uh, Southern Side is in the heart of Greenville and it's in the heart of me. Uh, again, my name is Mary Duckett. I'm president of Southern Side Neighborhoods in Action. Uh, association, which was formed in 1986. Um, speaking of Mayberry Park, this is the only area that we knew growing up as Blacks. Uh, it was the only park for us. Um, segregated times. Uh, but we didn't know that uh, we were in the ghetto and Maybe we were in a poor community and we were happy to have some place to go and play. Uh, Charlotte High School, which was an icon in Greenville. They used to play baseball there. On Sunday, they did pick up basketball games. We had cookouts around the areas. Bands would come and play on the weekend. It was just a gathering place for, for Blacks all, from all over, not only in Greenville, but throughout the nation. Because if you came to Greenville and you were Black, you would have to come to Mayberry Park. It was, but this area was one of the most blighted areas in the city of Greenville, a few blocks from Main Street. It was that way because it was an underserved area. Uh, we had everything from a junkyard to incinerators to stockade for women's. All of this was located in our area. There were actually not houses uh, along that stretch. They were along the Hudson Street area. And it was predominantly black. We had a lot of grocery stores and moms and pop stores. In the early 80s, they had planned to bring this loop through Southern Side, which would have demolished and really totally destroyed the total city. So we had a young lady who was just coming out of Furman, uh, Lillian Brock Fleming, and we talked her into running for city council because of this loop. And with her help on city council, this didn't happen. But what really happened was the highway department had bought a lot of property 
in this area, which made the area even more bright. But as things progress, and this loop didn't happen, but we did wind up with Pete Hollis Highway later on, which actually moved um, hundreds of families out of Southern Side. But the one thing about the mayor and city council is when we went before them and they were talking about this park, there were a lot of inclusiveness that uh, happened from the neighborhood. And I was glad of that. We had the children's at A.J. Wittenberg School, um, which is a school of engineering. The kids from St. Anthony uh, Catholic School. These kids were the one that um, said what we should have in the park. Now, what you're seeing here is, I guess you could say, it would say like I said, the backyard of Greenville. You got the railroad tracks. You got the river that was, as the mayor said, there was a number of mills throughout the area. Because you got to, in, in case you didn't know, Greenville used to be the textile center of the world. Uh, and so this is what made it very, very popular uh, on the onset. But there was blackness in it. And then the industry moved out of uh, the country. And we were left with all these mills and the, this whole area just became more blighted. But with the uh, city, they put the, uh, they decided to put public works where Mayberry Park is in that area. The park was still there. But by now we had Cleveland Park, we had uh, Falls Park and all these other places that we were able to go. But Mayberry Park was in our heart and we still went there. But now you have to have a, uh, you had to reserve it. So that became a little problem for us, but we finally learned to live with that. The stockade, as I said, was an area where women was put in jail. They used to uh, wash their laundry and hang it up on the roof and we walked to school. In them days, you didn't have a school bus and our parents couldn't afford to let us ride the school bus, uh, the city bus every day, even though it was just a dime. Again, you're talking about an area that was underserved. Um, and it was a property area. But again, we didn't know that. But we were living in property because everybody in the area lived the same way. But as we would walk to school past the stockade, the women used to tell us not to do certain things, no work to the law, because we'd wind up there. One of the things I can say is that we were a family, no matter where you live, in that whole area of Southern Side. If you needed something, and there was always someone to help you. Ms. Lala Mae Brock, who was Lillian Brock Clemens' mother, um, starts feeding people off of her back porch for a while. Good one of them. But I, I just wanted to bring this up and let you know that if you haven't been to Greenville, please come. Okay. Hey, thank you, Mary. Uh, I'm going to kind of elaborate on some of the things that she, she talked about. So what we have here is a long-standing neighborhood uh, juxtaposed against the river in, in a heavy industrial area. It really was Greenville's backyard. When we first started talking to the neighborhood about the idea of a park, green space, we had a large turnout for our neighborhood meetings. And um, the thing that was most striking was that people came to the meeting in, in support of a park. But somebody said at the meeting something that really hit home with me. They said, you know, this is a great idea because for generations, the people in the Southern Side neighborhood had been aware that the city puts all of its junk 
in our backyard. And I never got over that comment because it's true. For generations, the city of Greenville put everything we didn't know what else to do with in their backyard. And I'm gonna show you uh, what was in the backyard of the Southern side along the river here. Um, this is a photograph from the 19, uh, early 1960s, uh, but it could be a photograph from any period of that 40 year time span. So if you look to the left, you'll see the river, uh, which is a, actually a WPA project. It was channelized in, 19, in the early, uh, early 1930s. But in this, uh, in this particular neighborhood, here's what you have, and you won't believe some of this. We have uh, not one, but two landfills, uh, junkyards, they called them back then. One of the junkyards, one of the junkyards was actually an incinerator. So you had an incinerator and a landfill in this area. Uh, you had a police firing range. Now, we heard that and didn't really understand the significance, but the neighborhood did. Uh, they said there was a police practice range in this park, in this area. And um, that meant that almost every house in the Southern side neighborhood had bullet holes in it. We could, we've never heard that story before. We did our research and found out that yes, yes, it's true. There was a police firing range, practice range in this area next to the landfill. And on weekends, it was open to the public. So you can imagine what, that, what happened then. Then in the same neighborhood was a city jail. Um, actually, it was a women's stockade. They apparently put the men one place and the women someplace else. So the women's stockade was down here and that, re that remained there for about 30, 40 years. This is a picture we found later, 1953 of the inside of the beautiful women's stockade. Uh, then there was the issue of flooding. Uh, the river was there. It remembered their textile mills up and down the river putting in chemicals. The river did not smell good. In fact, it smelled really bad and it wafted into the neighborhoods. And we heard about that. So we had the landfills, you had incinerators, uh, you had the jail, you had a, you had a flooding situation and not, it didn't just flood, it smelled bad. So this is a picture from 1949 uh, in a part of the Southern side neighborhood at one of the flood events. When the course of all this discussion with the neighborhood, learning this is, uh, you know, just what people really felt about this neighborhood. Uh, but we also heard a lot about the, the longstanding idea that the city needs to take all that junk out of a neighborhood and create a park. And one of the people we kept coming upon in the history of the neighborhood going back to the 1930s, roughly 1920s, 1930s, was a gentleman named Mr. E.B. Holloway. Uh, he was a community activist, uh, well-educated, college-educated guy, and he spoke for the neighborhood on many different issues of jobs and education in the community. And we also found this is a picture of he and his, and his wife, Hattie, uh, from 1939. He wrote a letter to the, to the newspaper in 1939 about the need for a park for the African-American community. We want the park because we need it. We want the park because our social and recreational life is at stake. Please give us a park in 1939. We wondered who this E.B. Holloway guy was because his name kept popping up in different points of history along the way. We found out that Mr. Holloway was the first African-American postman in the city of Greenville. And there's his picture with the U.S. Post Office. Uh, we also found out that the, city, that the Postal Service delivered the mail three times a day during that time. It was almost like uh, Amazon coming to your house all day long. Uh, well, in 1938, this is the this is the nice story to know. In 1938, something else happened in this in this area along the river. Again, you had the incinerators and the landfills. In 1938, the city recruited a developer for a minor league baseball team to the city. Things don't change. They had a minor league baseball team even then, and uh, he was recruited from from uh, New Jersey, and they. They needed a place to locate the baseball stadium, so they took. They went down to this park area, and they took the the only African the only African American park in the entire city. They split it in two, and gave the developer of the baseball stadium half of the land to build the baseball stadium. And the Southern Side community in 19 this is 1938, in 1938 the Southern Side community was outraged by this that the city had taken the land their park to build a baseball stadium. And Mr. E.B. Holloway and a group of Southern Side neighbors had the audacity to appear before the city council and mayor of the city of Greenville in 1938. And that would be a pretty gutsy thing to do. Went before the city council and, and protested the fact that the city was taking our land to build a baseball stadium. The mayor of Greenville at the time did not appreciate those comments. He gaveled Mr. Holloway down and said, sir, I'm sick and tired of hearing you talk about us taking your land. We're not taking your land. We're giving you a baseball stadium. 
to which Mr. Holloway returned to the podium and said, sir, my neighborhood, my people in my neighborhood cannot even sit in the stands of your baseball stadium. Very tense moment. That was 1938. The story gets better. In, in 1939, something happened that I, that I think is very typical of what happens in Greenville, South Carolina. In 1939, a year later, Mr. E.B. Holloway returned to city council. But this time, he was surrounded by a who's who of the Greenville business community. Many, many community leaders. Some of these names on the screen you see are still names that are known in Greenville today. And you see the newspaper article here, Plea for Negro Park here is pressed by advocates. It was in 1939. And by the way, it worked. Uh, the mayor and council did a, did a 360. Uh, they, they heard they were, they were sufficiently berated, publicly berated for taking away land for the park in the African-American neighborhood and committed themselves to look for additional land to build a new park for the, for the African-American community. The best we can see from the minutes of city council meetings and from newspaper articles is that this had some real legs to it. There were efforts made to find land or find a way to expand the park in 1939, 1940. Then World War II intervened in 1941. And after that, we just don't, don't see any further reference to it. Well, that's the history in the background. And now you know why the park is called Unity Park. And it's also, for the city of Greenville standpoint, it's the fulfillment of a pledge made 75 years ago to create a beautiful park in the Southern Side neighborhood. And that's exactly what we're doing now with Unity Park. Uh, in terms of the larger picture of the park uh, in, in this community, where this is, a, this is a very high growth area. Uh, BMW is here, Michelin is here. We have major corporate headquarters. The economy is very strong here and very diverse. So we're particularly interested in green space. Uh, we need to capture the moment to create parks and green space. So we have this wonderful bicycle and walking trail I mentioned a moment ago that's 25 miles through the city. Uh, very, very popular. We have lots of bike and walking trails all over the city now, a lot of green space we're creating. And that's part of the impetus to create Unity Park as well. Before we could create the park, you remember the, the highway bridge issue with Falls Park. We had, darn if we didn't have the same thing happen here. In the middle of this, uh, of this area in more modern times, uh, just the city had built the public works facility. It was a miserable facility built in the 1950s, but it was big. And before we could build a new park in this area, we had to relocate and build a new public works facility. This is some remnants of the old facility, but also tells you about the condition that existed just a few years ago in this area. A lot of blighted buildings and such. Well, we made the decision, it, it, just like taking down the bridge took a few years, but we, we made a decision to relocate and now we have a new uh, $25 million public works facility built on the other side of town. We cleared away the, um, the public works facility and other buildings in that old area. We began in earnest a community project, neighborhood uh, involvement project uh, to talk about the park and what people wanted to see in the park. These are some of the guiding principles of Unity Park uh, to build on the existing plans. Because as you saw, we had a lot of plans in the past about green space and what we might want to do. Uh, we have a very authentic civic engagement uh, over and over again. We made a commitment, uh, this is again over 10 years ago now, to affordable housing in the area, to do something about the, the larger neighborhood, not just the green space in the park. Uh, we talk about the, that, that's some of the bicycle trail you see there on number five. And also a large part of this is a commitment to clean up and make, make, make great, great improvements to the, to the Reedy River, which was in pretty miserable shape. And there's a picture there of that. So a lot of people participated in this. Uh, we, we asked the question, what do you want to see in your park? And the Southern Side community led the effort uh, in terms of every, every aspect of the park, even though it's going to be a, a community park at 60 acres, uh, it'll be a park that people will come from all over the region for, lots of green space, but it has many elements that they particularly wanted. And uh, you'll hear more about some of those in just a moment with the plans. We also adopted a, um, what we call a community uh, character district plan for the Southern side community. Uh, this kind of lays out from an urban design and urban planning standpoint and zoning, uh, how we want to maintain the stability and the look and feel of the traditional neighborhood that surrounds the park. So we put that in place. And then we did, we took this extra step. The city of Greenville not only owned a lot of property down by the river over several generations where we had the jail and everything, but we also owned a lot of property adjacent to the park in the southern side area 
and have owned it for, for generations. Uh, very properties that for, mo for the most part were abandoned, uh, but now with the idea of a park, they become uh, frankly beachfront property. They become quite valuable. And so uh, we were already seeing in the last couple of years, private developers come into this area and build condominiums and apartments. And today, if you go in this area, you'll find $800,000, $1 million apartments and condominiums dotted around the area of what is going to be Unity Park. We saw that happening, we were aware of it. So several years ago, the city council decided to take a very bold step. We took the properties that the city owned adjacent to the park, some nine acres, different parcels. Uh, their value is somewhere in the eight to $10 million range if we chose to sell the property, like we saw at, at, at River Place and down at Falls Park. But we decided to donate those properties to the Housing Trust Fund, which is our arm, if you will, of the city that handles all affordable housing in the city of Greenville. And so we're going to place on the adjacent to the to this park uh, up, I think our goal is around 400 affordable housing units, again, all with the participation of the neighborhood. And this is underway now, by the way, uh, the, we're going to have a groundbreaking soon for a senior housing project of about 148 acres. Uh, and that'll be the look and feel of the neighborhood. It truly will be a multi income neighborhood because we already have a million dollar condos right around the corner and they will be on the same block as senior housing, affordable housing. We're gonna have workforce housing, affordable housing, different, different uh, income levels to, uh, to achieve that vision. So we're underway now. Uh, we went in and demolished the public works department. We demolished several warehouses in the area. We're cleaning up the site. And today it is a full construction site as the park is being built. This is a glimpse of the river as it runs along the bike and walking trail, which is called the Swamp Rabbit Trail, by the way. Again, it goes for 20 miles. You, you drive up, you, you bike along this river section, but it's not a very attractive section. The river is going to be bulldozed. We're going to bulldoze the Reedy River and create a much more approachable river as it is in the downtown area already. This gives you a little glimpse of that. There's a vast area of wetlands on the edge of the park. Uh, we're gonna put down boardwalks and create a, a wonderful conservation environmental education area of the wetlands along with the park. And this gives you a glimpse of different pieces of the park. And again, the neighborhood was very involved. We have about three different children playgrounds of different ages. We have the, what will be the largest water spray park in the, in the region and lots and lots of green space on both sides of the Reedy River with bridges connecting the park together. All the history I just shared, uh, Reverend Holloway, uh, what happened in the 1930s when the city took the land, uh, really the heroic stories of the neighborhood and then the more modern day stories of, of neighborhood participation in the creation of Unity Park, it's all gonna be memorialized in a culture walk that runs through the middle of the park. We'll also feature in the park, one of the great heroes of the Southern side neighborhood, Ms. Lila May Brock. She's a personal friend of Mary Duckett. Uh, she died several years ago. And Ms. Brock uh, was kind of the leading force for many, many, many years in the Southern side neighborhood. And she too had an aspiration that one day this area might be a park. She didn't live to see it, but we're gonna memorialize her with a wonderful statue at the, at the entrance to the park. So today, when you go over there, um, there's some privately owned warehouses in the middle of the park that uh, you'll see in a minute have been wonderfully converted to be part of the park. The river is being bulldozed uh, and widened. Uh, this is part of the construction going on. There's a big, there's a parking area that's one of several on the edge of the park. We're very fortunate that one of the warehouses, very large one in the middle of the park, has already been already been converted into a food court with uh, some wonderful offerings there. And so we're, we're fortunate to have all that. Uh, by the way, I wanna tell you that these pictures were taken pre-COVID, so don't get too excited about people not wearing masks in these pictures because we do have a mask mandate in the city of Greenville. And also this park has its own version of the Liberty Bridge. In this case, it's the designer from Los Angeles. Uh, this is gonna be a 10 story observation tower that is illuminated at night, stands in the middle of the park. Uh, we're close into the mountains, so when you go up 10 floors, you have a wonderful view of the Appalachian Mountains in the distance. And on one side, you have the, the, the downtown uh, skyline as well. And that's going to be the Liberty Bridge moment, if you will, for this particular park. Oh, 
Mary, you want to add anything? I know you're a big fan of the of the tower. Yes, one thing about this tower that's really going to be great. It's going to be dedicated to first responders. I don't think we do enough to recognize those that is on the front line every day. This is one of my favorite things other than the Mayberry Field uh, in the fall. Well, I love it all really, but this is really uh, something that's going to be a tower um, and it's real, it's gonna be tall too. The thing about it is you can see the steps or there'll be an elevator, uh, but there's gonna, it's gonna be there and it's going to be in recognition of our firemen and policemen and uh, our service uh, individuals. And we'll be able to have different events there. Um, I'm just thrilled about it myself. We've had an interesting discussion about the, you know, the different elements of the park, the neighborhood participated in, uh, for example, the, uh, the children of the neighborhood wanted a spray park. Uh, it's right. And, and, what, and the thing I love about this is it's not far from Mayberry Field. Yeah, um, right, on, right on the edge. And there's, yeah. baseball, there's a beautiful baseball field as well. Right. So a, lot of, a lot of green space. But Mary, I was early on, I'm Mary, I'm, I'm, Mary's uh, actually in a separate room from where I am, so we can't look at each other while we're, while we're talking here, but um, she made the point early on when we were talking about this need for kind of an iconic feature in the park, like we have the Liberty Bridge over the waterfall, that um, she felt like this, it was important for the rest of the community to know where the Southern Side neighborhood actually is, and that this 10-story tower will finally really put Southern Side on the map, if you will, in our community. And, that was a very interesting way to, to look at it. But, you know, we have, a, we have a, a little bit of drone footage. It doesn't have any musical accompaniment or anything, and it does not cover the entire park. It only covers about uh, half the park. But this gives you a little bit of scene. I think this was taken about three weeks ago uh, of at least a portion of the park area. There's a, there's a tennis court complex that's already opened, as you see there. And you'll see it is a quite a construction site at this point. We have leveled everything there and we're beginning to bulldoze the river. And may I like to say also that tower, you can see the mountains from, from that tower if you go all the way to the top. And on a beautiful day, you can you can't see Russia, but you can see most of Georgia. <laughs> well, let me let me jump in here. Um, this is absolutely fabulous, and, and I can tell you that uh, there are a number of uh, students as well as community people who are working on park planning around the country, um, and they are a part of uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, there are a whole bunch of questions coming in, uh, and, and I want to get to those, but I want to make sure that uh, the folks from Boston um, have a chance to present briefly uh, the work that they've been doing. It echoes in a number of respects uh, the work that you've been doing uh, in, in Greensville. So let's um, hear from the Boston folks and then let's open it up for a, a wide conversation because there are a ton of questions coming in. So who's starting, Karen or, or Dan? I think Dan's gonna present, I, I, well, okay. I can totally start. I, first of all, I wanna say Southern Pride. I'm from Atlanta. It's so funny that now I'm the Boston person, yeah. um, but I'm from Atlanta and grew up down the street from uh, Olmstead Parks there. So, I mean, there've been amazing parks and history of design in, in all of these cities. And it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I lead the Emerald Necklace Conservancy here. And you know Dan Adams, who's joining us, is uh, is an amazing uh, architect and uh, leader of the architecture program at Northeastern. And I've had the pleasure of working with him on the realization that I think will come uh, in the near future of Charles Gate Park, uh, which is the a portion of uh, the Emerald Necklace that has been really challenged in much of the ways that your Falls River was challenged. And I, I feel like there's a, some really amazing themes in this work. And uh, if you'd like, Ted, I could certainly highlight a couple of those that I feel like really resonate. Um, you know, and I, I think it's wonderful to see these kinds of things because I think we all need to be inspired that these things are possible. 
You know, I think they are hard, they're difficult to do. So when I see the work of, of you, Mayor White, and, uh, and, and Ms. Duckett, and the leadership you have shown to do what you've done to mount the insurmountable, um, it tells us actually it is mountable. And it gives us it gives us some wind in our sails too because we also uh, have our have our fights. Um, uh, you know, I uh, today I guess I just wanted to mention I really loved the the point you make about things being out of sight. You know, uh, you know if something is out of sight, do you forget about it? Do you neglect it? Do you ignore it? Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I really I really loved the way uh, the river now becomes visible again, much the way we're trying to work on also a section of the Emerald Necklace. Um, but uh, Ms. Duckett, when you were mentioning uh, the fact that you are making the South Side neighborhood visible with the the, the tower, like it, it was, it, it's 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 such a realization of that you know that point that if we don't kind of make those things present and visible, uh, it's it's so important. Um, so Dan, Dan, I don't know if you had any any other there's there's you know, I also really love the theme of there are no new ideas. Like, you know, this this wonderful uh, postmaster had this idea, you know, a long time ago. It's really just about lifting those things up, and how can we how can we breathe things in, into the present? You know, um, Dan, did you want to add anything? Yeah, no, I mean, I just want to commend you, know, obviously, at the monumental effort. I'm sure that's gone in to kind of move the mountains to make this project happen. I, I think you know. Those of us who work in the realm of trying to make these projects happen just know, you know, all the obstacles. And so, you know, huge congratulations to you all. I, I guess I just wanted to highlight, I mean, the two things that really stood out to me is really important in kind of innovations that I think we're all grappling with are really kind of all the groundwork you're laying to understand the, um, the history of the site um, and the good kind of preparatory work you're doing. And, I want to specifically highlight, I think the the ideas of sort of, to be honest, like almost like pre-purchasing and pre-distributing property and allocating it for affordable housing in particular is I think super important and a lesson all parks need to start learning is that as much as we love parks and they're amazing, they have impacts and they a lot of those impacts are uh, inequitable and challenges. And so you have to like pre-plan for those impacts. And, you know, I thought it was really interesting that you even depicted it as sort of a lesson learned from the first park and sort of planning the development that comes after the park uh, with the planning of the park itself. Uh, so I, I want to commend that because I, I really think there are very few projects that I've seen that have have done that. And I think that's so important. Um, and then the other, I think, is grappling with the complex history of the site and being really honest about it. And, um, you know, it's it's sort of like easy to depict that as like, oh, kind of a how far we've come or let's say erase it and say, let's move on. But it's like, how can you possibly move on when there are so many sort of embedded inequities and, and those have to be grappled with discussed they have to be repaired and and i think the first step of that is to analyze it and so i really appreciate that you've even taken the time with us here today to sort of tell us those stories to unearth those stories uh bring people together and and sort of make that um aware i think the combination of that kind of historic recognition and the kind of sort of pre-planning the post park uh, environment is our lessons that I certainly will take uh, to my project. So I'm grateful for that. Yeah. So, you know, we're talking about infrastructure and uh, this conversation is driven in part by the hundreds of millions of dollars that uh, we all anticipate are going to be spent over the next couple of years on improving infrastructure. But it's not just about paving roads or, or fixing sewers. And maybe you can tell us um, from the Boston perspective, a little bit about the work that you've done at Charles Gate, uh, because not everyone knows about it, but it's a short walk from our campus, uh, because it does involve water management, as a lot of Olmsted's projects involved water management and resilience um, in, in much the same way that, uh, uh, that we see in South Carolina. So tell us a little bit about Charles Gate, and then let's talk about 
uh, some of the connections that exist uh, when uh, communities start to do this kind of planning. Absolutely. Um, I, I would, I would have, I'm happy to, uh, to talk a little bit about the whole emerald necklace. Um, I, I don't think I have a slide at my fingertips, but I could bring one up. Maybe Dan, I don't know if you, if you do, um, but I can, we can definitely pull up a, a map of the, of the emerald necklace. I mean, I really appreciate Mayor White, your, your, your story of the, how are we going to, how are we going to connect all these pieces? So um, Boston's emerald necklace uh, was uh, developed in uh, the turn of the century by Frederick Law Olmsted, and it was to solve a, um, a sewage problem, essentially. Uh, we had a lot of the same issues that you talked about, you know, in Greenville. Uh, we had uh, sewage, we had a city that didn't have a proper uh, sewage system and didn't ha hadn't really found a way to manage its uh, stormwater. And Frederick Law Olmsted uh, came in, he co he'd completed the work in Central Park, which you, you might uh, be aware of and he came uh, to Boston and he proposed essentially a, a a system that would connect all of the all of the all of the the waterways into a chain uh, and and I think it's really important to to note the way that the mayor's plan for Greenville is a really constructed system so today as we think about the infrastructure bills that are coming and are being considered by the Senate right now uh, those big investments don't only need to be spent as uh, professor landmarks point points out on roads and uh, and you know treatment plants or uh, which are good things and are needed, uh, but they can be spent on uh, on parks and on bike lanes and on uh, trees, which are essentially our our healthy infrastructure, our infrastructure for our lungs, right? And so there are those those pieces. Um, I can uh, I can see Dan. I don't know if you had if you wanted to pull up a slide or two. I can also um, find something in a, in a minute and pull it up a Q, during a q and I don't have it on my finger. Yeah, I, it might take me a second just to find the emerald. But I mean, I wanted to add to that because I, I guess what I wanted to say, I, I felt when I was, this is sort of a global subject, but on this topic of infrastructure, Ted, I kept thinking during your presentation, uh, Mayor White and Mary was, um, <clears throat> you know, what, what so obviously this project sort of calls for and demands is like, and, and I think you're really achieving you know struggling with and achieving right is like how do you like reallocate you know we've got so many cities that are so wealthy and there's so much grandeur and there's so much success and then you know you're trying to deal with a you know a park and a landscape that was so sort of disadvantaged and disinvested and just you know to be frank cruelly treated right and and that again that legacy and that history exists and i mean i think some of our work dealing with a lot of infrastructure sites is like how is it that we as a nation as a state as a city can find ways to kind of reallocate funds and interestingly enough i find sort of for better or worse <laughs> the, the, the like infrastructure systems of this country and the agencies and legislation that manage them are some of the few ways that like we can literally move investments uh, around the country and it's 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 both a i always reflect on this in our work because I don't want to reinforce that system. Um, you know, it's sort of like we we almost tend to find uh, like Karen and I are dealing with this right now. Like, oh, one of the only ways we can get serious investment into the Emerald Necklace is by partnering with the Highway Authority because they have such significant investment in highways that we're trying to like almost convince highway authorities to invest in public space. Uh, and it's it's sort of a perversion because it makes people like Karen and I addicted <laughs> to like the highway department, as opposed to what Ted is saying is like, why can't we just invest in trees and parks as fundamental infrastructure? And and that's it's a really complicated reality in our sort of financial systems and funding mechanisms in the country right now about how to kind of move wealth from and concentrate wealth is to have to sort of play that um, game. It's interesting. I think I think Olmsted achieved that. I think you guys are all achieving. It's like, I think his way of getting people to invest in a major park system was to build stormwater infrastructure. So it was like almost leveraging infrastructural investments. I, I would love to live in a world where people would just see the sheer value and kind of health and recreation and you know places for cultures and communities to come together but in perhaps our kind of imperfect scenario right now it does seem that infrastructure is the 
sort yeah. of one of the few mechanisms that we can leverage to redirect funds for kind of it, public good. It is, it is, it is the story of I feel like the last you know 15 years of my work life, which is I the the, the water departments and the road departments have money parks provide and relate to both those things so i find ways to convince the roads and the park and the water departments to build parks and invest in parks like that is because the the parks in massachusetts uh have less than one percent of the budget and despite the fact that there's record usership this year uh the parks budget does not appear to be increasing i just shared screen green can you guys see the map of the emerald necklace i have pulled up here um and i really i think i i really do i, I want to uh, Professor Landmark, can you make sure that we get back to um, Mayor White because I want to pump in for some ideas about uh, about funding for for these things because I I think that what he did was really tremendous and I and I don't want to lose lose that but quickly this is you know this is the historic emerald necklace uh, and you might you may see if you can see here can you guys see my pointer over here so this this piece of the emerald necklace is Charles Gate it used to be lovely. Uh, it's not anymore. It is, uh, it, it, it now has just, just like at the falls, uh, someone put a free one on top of it. Why? Cause they thought of it as free. It was like already owned. It was easy. You know, they plunked a freeway on top of it and roads were, roads were, 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 you know, what we, uh, in the fifties and the sixties thought we're going to, we're going to save us. We were wrong. Uh, but that's what we thought at the time. And let me see, I'm sorry. I'm trying to move around on my little windows here. Um, Done and uh, and what you can see here is this is the emerald necklace now, and right now you can see we have we have tried to strangle it. And in the words of a city official who would go unnamed, if we tried to kill it, we couldn't have worse. There's no way we couldn't have done worse to uh, to the Charles Gate area. I'm just gonna show you the emerald necklace uh, and the emerald necklace conservancy. There's three different property owners that we met, you know, the, the state and the city and the town. And I'm sure the mayor has his stories very similar to this, which is you're constantly uh, going back and forth between a few different jurisdictions. Um, I'm just going to briefly, I wanna show you the Charles Gate work that I've been working on with Dan. And I apologize. This is showing you some of the work we're doing now during COVID, which is important visibility work. Um, but uh, Dan, maybe you wanted to talk a little bit about, um, uh, this is our tree work. Uh, and there, I would love to talk to you at some point about the ways that private and public private partnerships can, uh, can, yeah. can, can, can support these things, which are not easy, but I think are necessary these days. But here's the, here's a little bit about the Charles Gate project. Um, here again is what this area had been. Uh, and I know any Northeastern student or faculty on this will know this is not the experience of this area now. Uh, there was simply uh, a, a railroad and now there's so much more there was a curved road a curved bridge that came from commonwealth avenue up to the back bay fence which actually had trees on it we can't do that today this was what uh the charles gate area was before we uh we uh, stuck a a, a road and uh, put a put a uh, the starro drive up and all these different pieces and, and strangled this natural system that was treating the water in the way that olmstead had wanted uh, here are some pictures of not not very savory moments. Uh, so, uh, Mayor, it's not just Greenville. We've got we've got them here too. And um, you know, how do we how do we think about that? But what you can see buried in this is the little piece of Olmstead's old bridge, just hiding there. Uh, and this was the old line of Boston. That's where Boston used to end. And then they stuck uh, 250 feet of pipe to pipe the river here to the Charles recently won the award of a D minus, D minus rating on the water quality. Um, and so I don't know, Dan, if you wanted to talk a couple things about this, I can just kind of go through a couple slides. Here's- Well, uh, let, me, let me just ask that the mayor yeah. respond to some of the uh, questions you've raised. Okay. About, uh, working with public works departments and yeah. state funding agencies that focus more on roads than on parks. Yeah, I'd be, be happy if on the final yeah. purple, those are beautiful pictures of the Emerald Necklace. And I have, a, I spent a lot of time up there. So I've been, up, I've been to most all your parks and uh, oh, wonderful. Really beautiful. Yeah, my, my daughter um, did grad school in Boston. So I went up there and she married a Boston guy. So there we go. Um, they're down here now. But anyway, 
uh, on the finance side, I do want to tell you two, two things, a little bit of luck, amazing luck on what's something I want to tell you about. And then you have the, how we did finance art, everything we did. First of all, the luck story, uh, going back to Falls Park, you know, I told you we had a highway bridge. It was owned by the state department of transportation. So you may think, well, so even if we wanted to tear it down, how did we, how did we get the state of South Carolina to allow us to take a highway bridge and tear it down? Well, this is the most amazing thing because it, it would have it would have been the project would have been dead from the very start if we didn't have something happen that probably would never have happened another time. At that moment in time, and we didn't know this until we got into it, the director of the highway department was a new appointee, but she, she was actually the first woman to be executive director of the highway department. And we went to see her and we discovered that she was the chairman of the Columbia Garden Club. <laughs> And it went from, it went from, you know, we, we were scared to death to talk to her. We thought, well, this is going to go, this is not going to go well. We're going to have a discussion with her about this bridge we want to take over. And do we even tell her that we're going to tear it down? If you give it to us, we're going to tear it down. And uh, she came to Greenville and personally inspected the site. And she, I mean, the first time she met with us, it was, how can I help you accomplish this? I mean, that would have never happened again. But there was a moment in time though when we found out that she was head of the Garden Club Council in, uh, in Columbia. So there you go. On the finance side, uh, we have a wonderful financing mechanism in South Carolina, at least, called the hospitality tax. Most jurisdictions have something like it. So it's a food and beverage tax. By state law, it can only be spent on tourism-related activities, and that includes parks. So we're very disciplined here. We 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 have a it's a very it's a growth part of our budget. Even even during COVID, uh, we didn't have as much of a downturn as we thought we'd have. It still kind of bubbled up. And we just we put the discipline to put it aside and we bond it. And so uh, we bonded uh, about $2 million a year to that finance Falls Park almost 100%. Unity Park, we bond about two, another another 2 million of this. It's about a $20 million fine. We bond 2 million, a small slice. We bond 2 million and we get about half the cost of Unity Park. Uh, the rest of Unity Park is paid for, again, good, good budgetary discipline. The river work is paid for with our stormwater fund, a separate fund of the city stormwater fee. It's the biggest stormwater project the city's ever done. Uh, we're doing the river with the stormwater fund. We have a utility fund that's paying for the undergrounding and the utilities. And as you know, that's extremely expensive, but it's taking care of the utilities. The other gap that still remains in this, what is about a $60 million total price tag. And you, if you include the river and the utilities, the rest of it is public private partnership private fundraising and on that we have just been we've exceeded all expectations and in the course of oh, just over a year we've raised 11 million dollars privately and that's major companies i'll give you an example michelin uh, michelin has their north american headquarters here in greenville we have a lot of french people here uh, they're in for a million dollars and the big green space will be michelin green uh, in the middle of the park and then on it goes with individuals, foundations, and other companies. Uh, BMW is here. We're in discussions with BMW now on what they might be willing to do for the park. So public-private partnerships and hospitality tax. And again, getting back to Falls Park, sometimes you got to be lucky. Wow, that's fantastic. So companies and, 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 and other stakeholders that realize how important it is for it to be a good place to live and work. Uh, and those investments make sense. The message has really been powerful and we've had a wonderful, unexpected opportunity. We've almost had no one tell us no. In fact, in fact, now we're in that curious state of fundraising. And if you've done fundraising, you know what I mean? Fundraising, we've, we've now achieved a, a sort of a tipping point and a critical mass where if you're a major company in town and you haven't contributed to Unity Park, <laughs> We're now having the second wave come in, but hey, uh, we want to we want to we want to do something in Unity Park too. So we have naming right opportunities for the bridges, for the playgrounds, you name it. But we started out with uh, we didn't talk to anybody who wouldn't give us a two hundred fifty thousand, five hundred thousand, or a million. And we we spent a year just in that category. Yeah. We're just now getting to the one hundred thousand, fifty thousand dollar range. We are going to be doing uh, the the same thing uh, as we move forward into uh, the Charles Gate. Uh, the Charles Gay project and, and the wonderful news, I guess our lucky our lucky break is that one of the bridges in the area is uh, about broken. It's just old. <laughs> so, you know, uh, all those, those, those pieces of infrastructure, and this is why I think the work that, um, you know, uh, Pete Buttigieg is gonna have a chance to do nationally, everything that was built in the 50s and 60s and 70s is reaching 
it's useful life. And so this is when you go, well, do you spend millions of dollars doing this or do you spend millions of dollars doing something a little different or, or less than millions, maybe even. Um, so I think that is very interesting. And I also and really you can, appreciate- And you can clearly show such a wonderful return on your investment. I mean, we saw that in Falls Park with you know $13 million park, $150 million of private investment within three years. I mean, just totally Unity Park the same way. The affordable housing section is, is, is a wonderful uh, part of it, but also we're gonna have a lot of private investment around Unity Park. So Good. it's all private itself over and over again. Could you talk about some of the environmental factors? We have a number of questions that come in uh, that have come in around um, how you protect the, the natural state of the river. Does it meander at this point? Um, are you doing testing of the water that would um, enable you to uh, uh, then uh, uh, use the water differently than it might've been used in the past? Uh, how, how do you deal with those environmental uh, kinds of uh, issues around this chain? Yeah, and, and from the very beginning, uh, the green space and the environmental aspect of the park is, is a huge principle of the park, if you will, that it's going to be a green park. So everything from the light fixtures that are in the park to the materials, it's all going to be certified as, as in our own little system of uh, make sure we have good, good green architecture and such. The river itself really is a, is a magnificent work of, of cleaning up of a river. Um, the water quality uh, is going to be greatly improved because the entire landscaping, re-landscaping, if you will, the Reedy River, uh, the, the folks we're working with, the water is cleansed, if you will, as it flows through the area in a way that it's certainly not now uh, with the choice of the plants and the, and, the, and the rock formations and all that. So that's kind of cooked into the whole process. It's, a, it's about a half a mile of improved river to improve the quality downstream. We have a, we do have testing stations up and down the Reedy River, and we're watching that already. Um, the river, thankfully, doesn't begin too far away. It's only a couple miles upstream that it kind of bubbles out of the ground, and uh, so we're able to to monitor the whole thing. And we're mainly just our biggest issues have been, uh, you know, decades of 1950s and 60s. Um, uh, coal ash issues and things like that, but we're focused on that too. But cleaning the river and creating a more natural stormwater collection system is, is a huge part of what the, the river plan's all about. So how would you describe uh, the, the benefits that have accrued uh, to the community that was originally there? I mean, there's a lot of discussion about racial equity um, and about environmental justice. Um, you've taken a neighborhood that was uh, primarily African-American. You've made improvements, but how would you describe in, in the most tangible ways what the benefits are to that original community that was there? I'll let Mary talk about that if you'd like to, Mary. Yes. One of the things that has happened, uh, Duke Energy, because I was a, a power plant in, located in our neighborhood and of course that tar ash was a thing that has been a problem. But we're working on that with the group. Um, and they have done a great job. Uh, it's because we have truly been on them uh, about cleaning up. Because of where it was, they just scratched the surface at first. So now we have them doing wells and they're cleaning up our area. Um, hopefully when they get that property cleaned up, it can be used for affordable workforce houses and things of that nature. But they're doing a good job of putting wells in to monitor uh, the river and everything that's coming out from that area, draining into the Reedy River. I think it's fair to say that this uh, the project has sort of pulled the curtain back on 50 years of environmental yeah. uh, issues, uh, you know, dumping grounds in that area. And Duke Energy has come to the table, for example. And to be honest, you know, I don't think we'd be where we are with them today, but for the fact there's so much attention on Unity Park and the river in a new way. I think Mary would agree with that. We, we have their attention now so they're doing some major cleanup. Uh, of the coal ash issue over in that area. Yes. But that's that's actually I think really hits on why I think that that kind of pre-planning in a way I'll even call it pre-purchasing like laying the groundwork for a let's say an affordable housing planning process or a land 
distribution or a city management strategy is so critical. I mean, we've been watching that throughout Boston Harbor, the kind of, let's say, celebrated cleaning of the harbor and the deindustrialization, and yet the like the rampant displacement of communities and unbelievable property growth as a response to that environmental cleanup, right? So it, I think that, that that sort of seed that you're planting in terms of... Um, sort of planning for those benefits well in advance. I think we've, you know, and I, I do think this has almost been a national kind of a learning process, right? As we maybe post-World War II have gone through a period. I mean, we keep identifying the 50s and 60s were this sort of relatively atrocious period of infrastructure and industrial, like heavy-handed development on cities. And then I, 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 I guess when you look at it in decades, it's only in recent decades that I think we've even been able to go through this like kind of post-industrial process and then start to reflect on now actually all the kind of rampant displacement and gentrification that's resulting from that and really needing to reflect on that. Like kind of we know enough now to see that these processes are going to set in motion a series of actions that we just have to plan for and write policy and legislation for long before we build the park it's, or long before we even tear down a major environmental degradation. There, there is a, a predictable outcome after that that needs to be planned for long in advance. And so I, I really think that that piece of your Unity Park project is probably the most uh, innovative and important at this point. I, I think that's really spectacular. So now that you're well underway with this and, and we can see the economic and social benefits that are accruing, what was the toughest part of getting this done? Well, for us, the, the, the toughest political part was finding a, a commitment for $25 million to move the public works facility because it really was sitting smack in the middle. So we could have all these wonderful ideas about a park and a green space, just like we had around the waterfall. But until we could find a way to do that. And politically for me and my members of city council, that dragged the process on for years, Anne-Marie. <laughs> and uh, you know, I had to have several elections and people had to fight it out at the ballot box of whether they supported taking this big step. And we finally, we finally had a vote. It was basically a, kind of like a six to one vote at the end of the day, but uh, we weren't there in the beginning. And then second one would be the issue of gentrification and our, our awareness that that if you build a green space in the park, it's a wonderful idea. Everybody wanted to do it for generations, but, but, but. And, and that was real. We understood that. So we really, you know, before all the discussion nationally about social justice and all, we were already deeply engaged in this issue here uh, on this particular point um, that we were going to do something different here and we were going to, you know, Come up, find a way. To, we weren't going to stop gentrification. I mean, change is happening in the area. You could already look around and see the condos and the, and the high-rise apartments and all going on. And, uh, and and by the way, going on in an area that you know they were building apartments and condos um, in expectation that in the future they'd be a park there. So that's that's quite a that was quite a surprise to us. We didn't expect that. And we had to say, we got to put a stop to this. I mean, it's wonderful, but we're not going to let this entire area be, be changed right so radically. So we did put a time out. We put a moratorium on, on development for a while and, uh, and brought in the planners and had the neighborhood meetings. And we came up with this idea, okay, we can't stop everything happening in the area. We can at least have what we call a beachhead. We have these eight or nine acres of city-owned property. We can commit those properties to affordable housing, a mixed income neighborhood. And at the end of the day, we'll probably have more people in the workforce housing category, if you will, living in the neighborhood than ever that have lived there in 40 years. Um, it'll be bigger than the neighborhood's been in a long, long time. And, and that's the role Mary played. And because we had skeptics, we probably still do, in fact, that maybe, maybe this won't happen or something, but we certainly had our, our opponents and our skeptics that uh, the city was not being honest about or not being truly committed. Uh, even though we kept telling them, no, we're, we're actually going to donate the land. That you all didn't believe that. There's no way the city's going to donate million dollar property and people called it beachfront property you're not going to take beachfront property and just give it away and we and i'm really proud of my council we said yes we are <laughs> we really are and we did and, we're, and that's what we're, we're building these again these these workforce housing I mean, these, these people these people are going to be living on the, the best property in downtown Greenville with this beautiful park and they're in their vista out their window and their balcony I'm going to just dwell on this for another second, Ted, because this is such a big deal. Like kudos to because didn't happen at the High Line, 
in New York. It didn't happen at all of these big projects in these big cities that have a lot, you know, those pro a lot of these projects did not build it in in advance. Yeah, and the fact that we did well. is major. And I really just don't, I want, I, I don't think there are too many projects like this around the country that did that in, in such a deliberate uh, way mm -hmm. and a really an exp and an expensive way and in an expensive big way. And I think that's, you know, anyway, that's a, that's a real tribute to Lee. Well, I got to answer to Mary Duckett. I mean, you know, <laughs> so well, I, I want to, I want to like acknowledge, cause I'm just listening to you and I'm yes, trying to one pick of the out. Things, um, that I'm so pleased with is the senior housing. Um, I'm glad because see, you know, I said to the mayor, and I was like, I bug city council every time I get a chance. I try and not let them get away with anything. Uh, <laughs> so I'm an advocate for senior housing also. And uh, I said to the mayor, I said, you know, seniors want to live around the park also. Though they can't afford these million dollar condos and what have you. So if you go do this property and give it away to nonprofit organization and a housing fund, what about the seniors? And I have to say kudos to him because he said, well, we'll see about that. So as he said, we have a number of senior housing projects that's going to be there. And the seniors can get out and walk to the park. They can see the park from their balconies and what have you. And this is important because the two most important group of people are the seniors and the children. Yes. We need the seniors for the knowledge that they bring to the table. And we need the youth for the innovative way that they look at the future. So um, the kids love the water park and, and they can't wait to get in that water park. Mm -hmm. um, seniors want to be in those houses. I'm three of them. I'm, I'm, I'm an advocate for that park. And it's been a... Um, trying times for the mayor. He's, he's had this vision for such a long time and I encourage him never give up on your vision. It's important. It touches a lot of people. Well, so I, I, we, I, are, I, we're at the end of our time. Uh, mayor, do you want to um, make a closing comment? I just well, wanted to say, if, if I may, that I think that the idea of senior housing and housing as being infrastructure is a pretty neat place to think about and to, to land as a community. It's part of community infrastructure that supports uh, this park infrastructure and, and these things. And it's, it's really interesting. I'm really glad that you gave us so much to think about here in Boston. Really, thank you for all of the work that you do day in and day out. I know it is hours and hours of meetings at nights and weekends and calls and like and you know the the generations of, of Green Villians will uh, it, it owe a debt to you. Right, well, Mayor. Thank you. Closing comment. <laughs> well, the well, park means so much to not only the southern side, but to the to totalization, the city of Greenville and the county and the nation because people are going to want to come to see this park from all over the world. Liberty Bridge was fantastic. We got an award for it. Unity Park is going to be off the chain, as the young people say. And the thing about Unity Park is that so many people have had an opportunity to be invested in what would go in this park. And the thing, Unity is the last letters of community. And with that being said, it means inclusiveness. Everybody has, a, has something that they can do in this park. They, they can feel a connection. It's, it's going to be a place that um, to bring the children together and the seniors. And that's what's so important to me. Thank you. Well, our motto is, uh, in the beginning, it's been Unity Park, a park for everyone. <laughs> And a little bit we know as we travel through the last couple of years with everything going on in this country, how that, that message would seem so alien, frankly, to a lot of people. And uh, we've maintained that vision all along, and we're still doing it. I'm just very proud that in Greenville, we're 
the biggest thing people talk about is is something called unity and that's that's pretty amazing right now it's a fabulous fabulous piece of work thank you for doing that and so wonderful to share it with all of you thank you very much yeah and and uh, we will spread the word on this uh <laughs> so you can find your part yeah, a little out. bit more crowded yeah. please do Anne-Marie, you want to take us home? Sure, thank you. And again, thank you, uh, Mayor White, Mary, uh, Dan, and Karen. Uh, one of my you know, many things that I really enjoy about my job at the Rudy Bruner Award is the opportunity to not only visit and learn about remarkable places like Falls Park, uh, but to spend time with people like the mayor and to share the stories of the amazing work you're doing. So I'm so thrilled that we got a chance to do that this evening. Uh, just to remind everybody, a recording of this session will be available on the Myra Craft website, as well as our Rudy Bruner Award website when it's available. Our Rudy Bruner Award website also has links to additional information, including the case study about Falls Park. So if you want to learn more about the story of how it came to be and dig into some of the numbers, uh, we do have that included in the case study. Um, also, just a reminder, you probably have a few more, a little bit more time if you haven't, if you're interested in AIA CEUs credits to just um, go into the chat box and find that link. Uh, next, uh, next week, we're going to be going to the west coast of America to Los Angeles, where we are going to spend some time with the designer and the developers of La Cretz Innovation Campus, which is a, uh, a clean tech facility and demonstration um, project that was developed by the city of Los Angeles, a, the major public utility company and several other partners as a way to showcase green technology. And actually it's part of the city of Los Angeles's efforts to really position itself as a green leader. So another interesting story. So again, thank you everybody for joining us and we look forward to, to seeing you next week. Okay. Good night. Good night, thank you very much. Thank you very much.